Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's uh, weekly online event where a webinar, a webcast, a online show, uh, whatever you want to call us, we are online, <clears throat> excuse me, and we are live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. We are free and open to anyone to watch, so um, there you can uh, log in from anywhere you want to. Um, we also record our shows every week, and those are also posted to our website, free and open for anyone to watch after the shows are over. Um, and we do a mixture of things here at Encompass Live, uh, presentations, book reviews, mini training sessions, um, interviews, <coughs> excuse me, basically anything that is library related, we are happy to have on the show. We do have Nebraska Library Commission staff sometimes do presentations, but we also do bring in guest speakers sometimes, and that is what we have this week. Uh, on the line with us is um, Heather Imhoff. She is the Head of Public Information Services at the De Plains Public Library in Illinois, De Plains, Illinois. So hello, Heather. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, and I, I saw a post that Heather had done, I believe it was on the... State Library's website or this, the Library Association, I can't remember now, you did a blog post. It was the Illinois Library Association. Illinois Library Association, right. Did a post about this um, program for doing um, advertising, the e-resources at their library. And I just thought it was really cool what they did, very um, great way to get this kind of information out there. So I reached out to her and said, hey, come and talk to us about it too. <laughs> so... Um, Heather is with us today, and I will just hand over to you now, um, Heather, to do your presentation. If anyone has any questions throughout the show, just pop them in there, and um, we'll grab them as they come up. So go ahead and take it away, Heather. Okay, thanks. Um, I have to say that this is the first time I have done this, so it's really kind of odd to me. I'm sitting at my computer and talking to people. <laughs> well, we've got a pretty good audience of about 15 or so people on the line, so you've got a rapt audience all watching you. <laughs> All right, awesome. So if anybody has any questions, please just chime in, because this is a fairly informal presentation, um, and really the first time I've done it out loud. So, um, so thanks. I'm glad that you're interested. Um, we have called this the anatomy of an ad campaign, um, but really it's just kind of what we did at the Des Plaines Public Library last year to advertise our e-resources, which are a growing portion of our catalog and our offerings. Let's see here. Um, First, a little bit about me. I had to put my picture in because I always get distracted in webinars trying to envision what the person talking looks like. So um, that's me. I am the head of public information services at the Displays Public Library. My area at the library is marketing communications and public relations and branding and the graphic design department reports to me and supports our initiative. And I also do a whole lot of other at the library. I do a lot of board relations. Um, I wind up being the person in charge of lots of special projects and um, doing strategic planning and that kind of stuff. So I really like it, and it lets me do a lot of different things. Um, I'm not a librarian, but I love libraries. I've been with libraries for about eight years now. Um, I wound up at my local library after I had moved from the city and had two small children. Um, my background is in consumer and trade events and producing big events. So um, this is a big change of pace for me, but eight years later, I'm still here, and I still really like it. One of the things that's really helpful for me in my job is that I report directly to our library director, which gives me a lot of access and cuts out a lot of the red tape that has helped me to do things like the project we're going to talk about today. Okay, so a little bit about the Displeans Public Library. We are a mid-sized public library. We're a primarily working class community with 59,000 residents in the suburbs of Chicago. If you know where O'Hare Airport is, we are directly to the north of O'Hare. Airplanes fly over us, um, and we're, we're right next door. Mm -hmm. yes. About one-third of our residents... Been through there many times. <laughs> yes, there you mm -hmm. go. So, um, about one-third of our residents have a college degree or equivalent. Sixty percent of our population has a library card when you work the numbers. But when we really delved in and looked at the households in the community that have cards, 90 percent of our households have at least one library card. So um, not every person has one, but 
people are using the same card in the household in 90% of our households, which is, um, I think, a really good indicator of how important our library is to our community. Nearly 40% of our residents were born outside of the U.S. So what's really kind of unique about Des Plaines is that we're a large, really racially diverse community that is kind of blue collar and working class, surrounded by a lot of um, very affluent, kind of more upscale communities in the area. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic, and it allows us, again, to access and do a lot of programs that are a little bit uncommon in our community and in our area of Chicago. Um, a little bit more about the library. Um, our 2014 budget, just to put things into perspective, was $6,485,000. We have operated in an environment over the last seven years where we have been kind of really looked to by the city. We um, are a city, we are a municipal library to lower our tax levy, and we have done so by 1.5% over the past four years. So our levy is going down. But because um, we have been able to save over the years, we have been able to keep our, our spending pretty even. And in fact, we've been able to raise enough capital, um, capital funds to do a very exciting $1.2 million capital project starting this year. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but what this project is letting us do is create two dedicated, flexible digital training centers and digital literacy centers on our third and fourth floors that will really help people to learn how to use our e-resources and digital resources and really hands-on help us to reach the members of our community with the training to actually use our products. The campaign that I'm going to show you is really pushing the product, but there is a disconnect between us having all these products and our community being ready to use these products. And so this whole project addresses that. We're going to, we're going to really train people to use our products. Um, we're also going to be doing a new collaborative space for teens and more support for our early literacy initiatives, which a lot of libraries are doing now. Um, Krista, I'm curious who in the audience is from public libraries as opposed to other other places. Um, let's see. Do you have a lot of public libraries out there? We do have quite a few of them, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I see maybe a third of the people on right now who are actually logged in are uh, public libraries. I'm just kind of looking at my list here. But we have some university and some school, actually, too. Good. Okay. All right, so a little bit about the e-resources. Again, I'll get to the campaign in just a moment, but our campaign was all about promoting the e-resources that we have to offer. And um, the four main ones that we focused on in the campaign are these teeny little pictures, which you probably can't read, but what is my medium all? One is Freegal, which is a music sharing product. Um, one is Vineo, which is a um, e-digital magazine program, and then the last is Hoopla, which is streaming music and movies. Um, overall, for our library, in 2014, we had an $861,000 materials budget. Of that, only $86,000 was dedicated to e-products, so it was about 11% of our materials budget. Um, Having said that, that doesn't sound like very much, but my people who buy these things tell me that they buy everything that is available. So um, I think it's interesting to note that what is out there and available for libraries to purchase and provide to patrons is still pretty slim. Um, overall, e-products were about 3% of our total circulation in 2014. So when I start talking about numbers and moving things, we are still talking pretty little numbers because the usage and um, the amount of products in our collection is still pretty small. Um, we have, as a library, been focused on downloadable and e-stuff for, for a long time. Um, we first offered downloadable audiobooks about 13 years ago, and we had you know, a couple of the very first e-readers available. Um, but we really kind of increased our focus about five years ago when the whole Kindle craze hit, and we wanted to be able to service that group. So any questions about that before I move on to the what what we did? 
Um, let's see, nothing's come in, but um, anybody have any questions, type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface or let me know that you have a microphone and that you want to use and we can unmute you. Okay, great. All right, so um, the next part is just delving really into the campaign we did. Um, I've organized it in the what, who, where, when, and why um, way. Um, first was what? We did a $19,000 consumer advertising campaign with the same tagline used, used throughout the campaign. Your DPPL library card is the most valuable card in your, in your wallet. This was not the first year that we have done this campaign. This is actually year three, and we have used the same um, tagline over the course of three years. Um, this is the first year that we have done the campaign to such um, a large extent. And also the first year that, honestly, we had like kind of the graphics to go along with the campaign. We had a kind of lame piggy bank design last year. Um, but, but we really have tried to keep the continuity of the your DPPL library card, the most valuable card in your wallet, going across all three years. The campaign we did in 2014 included print, digital, and email components, and it was paid for by a state of Illinois per capita grant. Our library got $68,000 in grant funds in 2014, and of that, I had about $20,000 to work with for this campaign. And then right below there, you'll see just one of the components from the campaign, which was um, an ad that went on a ch local Chamber of Commerce map. So why? Why did we do this campaign? Well, um, for years, when I've sat in board members, excuse me, in library board meetings, I've heard board members, board members discuss again and again, how do we reach people, how do we reach non-users, how do we get everybody in our community to know about all the resources that we have to offer. There's just this, this need to, and desire by the board to reach everything and everybody with everything. Um, they were really envisioning, I think, direct mail and those kind of things, but um, that in our community is just really cost prohibitive. And we never really got anywhere with that until we kind of launched onto this campaign idea. The second reason, and the more important reason why, um, we think from a staff perspective is, you know, we spend a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of energy investing in these e-resources. And we as staff really want to see an increase of the usage of these fabulous and fantastic materials that we have to offer. So that's kind of the why behind it. The when. We ran this campaign in November and December of 2014. We timed it to coincide with the holiday shopping season and a time when patrons were shopping for digital devices and also looking to save money, both on digital devices and just save money in general to do more shopping. Where? OK, so I'm going to run through the different places we did this advertising and show you the samples of what we did where. This first is about a it's about a seven inch by twelve inch ad that ran in the Daily Herald. Um, they were four color quarter page print ads. The Daily Herald is a very large regional newspaper in our area. Um, it's not the Chicago Sun Times and it's not the Chicago Tribune, but it focuses on the Chicago suburbs, and it allowed us um, the chance to run kind of a focused campaign in just our Des Plaines area. Um, with this with this ad. It's kind of hard to see the ad and the text in the ad, but again, it focuses on our different products in language that should be familiar to people. It's all about streaming movies, downloading ebooks, um, downloading your favorite magazines, free music from Regal, and that kind of thing. And it also then also talks about needing a DPPL library card. If you see here, get started at dppl.org slash save. We created a splash page on our website that you could go to to get an overview of all of these materials. And this is also a custom URL for this campaign so we were able to track the amount of hits that we got from this particular ad. And the cost of this ad was, this ad campaign was $7,200. Um, we have a large Spanish component to our community, so we also chose to run two quarter page ads in the Spanish language um, newspaper in our area. Those were really relatively um, inexpensive at $780. Um, we had to focus 
because it was a smaller ad and we can put everything in there, but um, we, um, we worked with the translator to make sure that we had this all translated properly and in the right kind of colloquial verbiage that we wanted for this campaign. All right, so another where, um, as part of, our, part of our Daily Herald campaign, the Daily Herald has a very robust website um, and kind of online news platform. So we purchased 375,000 keyword-driven digital ads over a six-week period. Um, that cost $2,250. You can see a sample of two of these ads. Here's one right here. Here's one right here. I believe that this is a mock-up they made for me. I don't think that there was ever a time when you were seeing two displays public library ads on your Daily Herald homepage. Um, if you did, that would probably be really annoying, and I wouldn't have wanted that to happen. But um, we actually got a whole lot of traffic from um, this. was one of the best, um, as far as hits to our website through through the campaign, and actually hits to the e-resources splash page that we created. Um, that got, it looks like about 250 kind of direct go to the website and use our product. Um, from this campaign, which, you know, I don't have a lot of experience in ad campaigns above and beyond this. It either can seem like a lot of hits or not very many hits. Um, I'm told that this is a lot of hits and this is good for this product. So um, that was the online advertising that we did. Uh, we do have a, Heather, we do have a question about that, I believe, back to the... Um, Online campaign yep. there. Did that go to um, question? Do you have a did you have a special landing page for this, or did the click throughs go to your general website? This, we had a special landing page. This for went this. to the slash the save page. The yeah yeah mm -hmm. like they but like we we ha we had a page we created directly for this campaign that kind of listed all of the additional resources promoted in the campaign with information on both. Um, how to go there and why to go there, and then also like kind of tutorials. And so, yeah, it went to that. Page. Okay, cool. <clears throat> um, okay, so this was something that was cool, and I have to say was not sure about when they pitched it to me, but wound up being one of the best performing components of the campaign, at least as far as awareness goes. This is, um, you'll see over here, this is actually a screenshot of a very long email campaign that they created for us. So you would be scrolling down to see all of this information. Um, it was an email that went out, of, it was three emails over a 14-day period to 30,000 people each. Um, it was from Daily Herald databases, and um, we really needed to focus in order for this to be effective, and so we chose a target they, we, we chose a target group of women, 18 through 40, interested in music and film within a 10-mile radius of a library. It cost $2,800. Um, $2, and we really we got a lot of traffic from this um, particular campaign. Um, I think we had something like a 15% click-through rate, which for kind of a direct mail email email unsolicited email is really a good kind of conversion rate. You know, normally you would expect 2 to 3% on kind of an unsolicited email and we got almost 15% clicking through to our to our website to look at these products. Um, when you look at it, it has Hoopla and it has start using Hoopla and learn more about Hoopla. It has um, free goal, start so we really had we had a lot of links built into this, so people could go just to the components they wanted or were interested in, or they could get more additional information. I will say down on the bottom, at the bottom of all of our ads, um, there is a place that says "Need a library card," and we talk about how you can get a Displains Public Library card, and then we have text in there that says, "Do you not live in Displains? Most libraries offer these products," and we we tell people how to go to their local library to try to to try to get the same products as well. So even if you weren't in the displaying target market and within our, our library card user area, these are relevant to different people. Uh, Heather, we do have a question about that email. Um, what I wanted to know is, uh, the question is, did you test the email messages to establish your, to establish your best message? 
Did you have different versions you know, or? <laughs> if I were a real advertiser and a real director <laughs> and marketer, yes, I would have done that, mm -hmm. but I wasn't. <laughs> so, um, you know, that goes to a point later on. You know, um, we have talked to them to some extent because this is the third year that we've been sending this campaign out and we've been tweaking it and simplifying it and trying to cut down the text as much as we could. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the target market goes, we didn't have that much room to play with some really direct imagery targeted towards women 18 to 40. We just had to target it mostly by that was the demographic they picked the, picked the target emails from. Um, so the Herald, Daily Herald picked that, or did you? Pardon me? Did the Daily Herald pick that target market, or did you guys decide, uh, figure, how, how did you figure that out? We worked together on it. Um, I went to the different, the four different resources that we have here and asked them what, what their main user base was, mm -hmm. and particularly to Hoopla, which is our new product we were most, inter most interested in promoting in this campaign, and Hoopla told me that their main user demographic was women 18 to 40. But that's how right. we settled on that. Ultimately, there's a lot of different user demographics for all these products, but um, but that's that's how we settled on that. And um, we were forced to do that for this email campaign because they have like a million emails, and you know we only got 30, so they wanted us to focus in order to select and have it not be random. Right. But. Okay, and so the Daily Herald had this service that you could work with them, because someone had asked about how did you narrow it down and did, what did the paper do for you. So they had this that you could contact them and they could help you to market to people they had previously been in contact with. Yeah, okay. yeah. The Daily Herald actually, we designed all the other ads, but the Daily Herald um, digital media department themselves designed this particular email oh. campaign for us, the graphics that we sent them. Oh, cool. And then they have access to these databases. Mm -hmm. I have to say, initially I thought that this was a database that they owned that were like subscribers or somehow they had collected all of these emails. Mm -hmm. um, but I really like figured out and discovered later that they actually work with um, email. They, they work with an outside group that collects and provides these mm -hmm. emails. Okay. That's why they have so many of them. Mm -hmm. um, which makes sense to me. I was confused about how the Daily Herald would have so many <laughs> yeah. um, of these people's emails. <laughs> because I know I don't give my email to the Daily Herald and, you know, don't necessarily look for unsolicited emails from the Daily Herald. Right, but, right. But um, they, I believe that it's a service they purchased these through and then pass that expense along to us. And again, it was, it was, we got a lot of hits from this mm -hmm. that I was not expecting, so. Cool. All right, cool. Uh, I guess my final point on that note is that if I had more than $19,000 to do this campaign and didn't need to use all of that $19,000 to actually buy the ad space for this campaign, I would definitely I would definitely spend some money to like work with somebody who would be better able to test it or you know professionally t you know kind of challenge the headlines and things that we have. Mm -hmm. but I don't. Oh. Yeah, a lot of it is the money, definitely. <laughs> it is. And, um, you know, just a side note, just, uh, just jumping ahead to something I was going to say before, I think that a lot of times um, in libraries, especially, we're perfectionists and we want, um, we're very hesitant to do something that will not be perfect or not 100%, you know, it's just there's this, there's this hesitancy to jump in and just do something. Um, because we're afraid we don't have the resources and we don't have enough knowledge to do it. And I struggle with that all the time. And um, it's particularly like with this, I'm like, I'm just going to do this. I have this money. It needs to be done. Mm -hmm. I want to use it. I'm just going to, I'm going to give it my amateur shot and go for it. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's better than not doing mm -hmm. it, I guess. Jump in there and at least try. It's, it's okay to fail and then you'll learn what you can do better next time. Potentially. Right. So that's, that's my bit of advice. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, okay, just a couple final there. We have a very small local newspaper that's kind of our hometown newspaper called the Displays Journal. And we, were, we did eight actual inserts into the Displays Journal. You're looking at the front of it and the back of it. Um, that physically got inserted into the newspaper. There were 40,000 pieces that we printed, and they go 
they go to a lot of the senior citizens and people in our community who still read very localized news and print. Um, um, this, we also, we also did a lot of promotion of the campaign in-house. What you're looking at here is the library's homepage. It continues to scroll down further if you were actually looking at it. Um, we have a splash page, we have a kind of splash graphic section here that changes about every week and um, we focused, we, we, we used it. <laughs> Um, we put it on our home page, and then we have a click here to the campaign, and this actually goes to that same page, um, the kind of DPPL save. Um, so we were able to track kind of clicks from the home page to that same page as well. I have to say that this did not look, that was not, it was not my favorite interpretation of our splash page thing, but, um, but at least it carried what was happening outside in the public and in, in the press through to our library. We also had internal banners and other stuff up in the library that echoed the campaign. And the very last but not least, we did a little bit of advertising in miscellaneous community-based um, places. This, as I said before, this was kind of a banner ad across the top of the community map that was being printed at the same time and distributed by the Chamber of Commerce. Um, the same campaign will be running in the Chamber of Commerce guide that's coming out. Um, we also did some advertising in the local high school um, sports newsletters that get printed twice a year. So I just talked about this a little bit. The target audience, when we had to pick it, like specifically with that women 18 to 40 demographic, um, interestingly, and, and I, I'm older than 40, but, um, but I understand why this is kind of a streaming and online and um, digital market, because these are, these are the people who have devices, know how to use them, and oftentimes find themselves in places with time on their hands while they're waiting and are using their phones or their tablets to do things. Um, secondarily, like I said before, oops, my phone's ringing. Okay, um, secondarily, new mobile device owners, and again, anyone with familiarity with digital resources and a desire to save money. So a little bit about the production of this. I alluded to this already, but all of our production was actually done in-house. So all of our money was spent on purchasing, and none of it was spent on production or design costs. I developed the marketing concept and wrote the content and actually purchased the ads. I have um, a manager of creative services who is a really super talented graphic designer who designed the ads for me. And then we also have um, a really great web services manager who worked very closely with me to get the right pages up on our website and to get the right custom URLs tracked so that um, we could kind of measure what was happening with the campaign and who was going there and what was working and what wasn't working. So the outcome, um, so we feel like we had a really high impact in an anecdotal kind of way. We had lots of talk about people coming in and saying seeing, they've seen our campaign and the campaign looks great and um, a lot of anecdotal information about awareness for the library specifically in these new offerings. Um, like I said before, that 60,000 dedicated email campaign alone had about a 10 to 12 percent open rate. So we had 9,580 people actually open those emails, and 1,340 of them clicked through, which is a lot. Um, and again, I think I said before, unexpected. I also think I said 15 percent before, so maybe I fudged. It was 10 to 12 percent, but um, that was way more than we expected. Um, overall, the circulation of e-materials was up 21% from December of 2013 to December of 2014. Our circulation of e-materials overall for the whole year was up 24.5% end of 2013 to end of 2014. So um, I'd like to think that that circulation of e-materials up 21% in December was all due to the ad campaign, but um, I don't know that I can necessarily say that. We put a lot more money into e-resources in 2014 than we did in 2013, so there was more to serve. Um, and 
just overall the public is starting to catch up and use these materials more. So, um, so it's hard to put your finger on exactly what kind of impact it has, but it seems like it's all at least working in tandem to support the trend of using these products more. Um, okay, so the opportunities that are apparent after we've done this campaign, um, it, still, it still seems, and I think most of you who work in public libraries and other libraries will, will understand this to be true too, um, ownership of digital devices, especially in our community, is still relatively low. Um, we have a growing use of mobile, mobile phones and people using their mobile phones to access the internet, um, but we don't have a tremendously high group of um, like tablet users and that kind of stuff. Um, also, kind of just in general, the platforms that are out there for e-resources are still restricted. You know, we as a library, that I, and I kind of object to this, are still really restricting quantities that people can can access, for example, for, um, for Frigo, which is our free music, music download product, um, you can download five per week, which is not bad and better than the three that we used to let people have, but still, for people who are heavy, you know, digital music users, it's actually kind of a, a barrier to usage, I think, because people don't like to be restricted and they're just going to keep going where, where they want to go to get their stuff. Um, Hoopla is our new digital streaming product, and you can you can you can download ten products per month, stream ten things per month. Which again, it's great and better than nothing. But for the people who are currently using digital in our community, they're, most of them are using them in a big way, and so we're not meeting the needs of our true digital users yet. I guess is what I'm saying, um, and I'm hoping that I can influence my colleagues to, to kind of ease some of those restrictions. It's all about money, um, but I personally believe that easing those restrictions is going to be the thing that really is going to get people to use our products more in the long run. Yeah, that's what I was actually going to ask was, is that something coming from the companies or is that a money thing that the library can only afford that many yeah. items? Yeah. You know, especially like for, um, for, for Hoopla, Hoopla is a pay-per-use product. Mm. So we pay any time somebody streams a product. So we as a library have imposed that 10 streams per month. Right. On the fact that we have X amount of dollars in our budget. I think that the group did some kind of numbers in their head where if every library card user like streamed, streamed two things, it would be like, you know, we'd have to spend $300,000 on who Right. And is that something we even have? Yeah. That's, yeah. Them, so. Oh, understandable. Um, yeah. But now, how long have you had Hoopla? Was that that's something new? We've only had Hoopla since September. Okay. So, so that's gonna you're gonna that's gonna be a thing where you gotta take a look now at what actually happened, how yeah. many people did use yeah. it, and then that can be adjusted to what the library is able to afford. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's that's one thing that I think that I have always brought to the library. I don't come from a library background. I come from a very commercial background, and I come from a very sales oriented background to some extent. Um, and um, so I'm always kind of the one arguing, arguing for more of a marketing. For, you know, I'm always I'm always the one saying, no, let's spend this money because it will get us X in the long run and, and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So, um, I think the last thing that is an opportunity for us and that I'm really very excited about is that um, right now in our community there is kind of a lack of digital device and e-material training. It's it's changing quickly, you know. We see a lot of um, older women and older people bringing their tablets in. Like even after Christmas, they got this, you know, they got their Galaxy Samsung tablet now, and they want to know how to use it, but they don't know how to use it. Um, that that capital project I referred to at the beginning of the event, um, or at the beginning of the seminar, we um, we're, we're building an actual flexible digital training classroom that is not behind closed doors, kind of in the back of the corner of our library, which it used to be. It's right on our main reference services floor, in the center of the floor, and it's flexible, and it's got a big screen, and it's got movable desks. So we can really like do classes on the fly and do training on the fly, and we can also um, make these visible so that if somebody is walking by and sees that we're, we're teaching a class on Facebook or we're teaching a class on how do you download my media mall to your materials to your tablet, they can just like walk in and sit down. I mean, they can just sit down. Um, and we, we, we are trying to remove those barriers. 
for sure, and that's really exciting. The other thing on our third floor that we're building next year is a tech device e-bar, where we're going to have we're going to have um, all of the different devices that people are owning and using currently, and we will have staff dedicated to standing there and showing people how to use these products, or alternatively to bring your product in and they will show you how to use it. They'll give you a 15 minute or a half an hour tutorial and show you how to actually download our products onto your device. Um, so, so that's exciting and that, that, that's the main opportunity that I think. I think that we have the products, but our products aren't being used not because people don't want them, but because they don't know how to use them yet. So. Mm -hmm. That's a really cool idea that hands-on, I know some people have done like um, one shot things like a petting zoo, a tech petting zoo, where they have a specific event, but this is nice to have an actually ongoing thing. Yes, anytime. Right. So we're excited about that. We think that's kind of putting there. So um, a quick wrap up of what I've learned. Um, first and foremost, lobby for the money. Um, $19,000 is not very much money to do any kind of impactful long term, especially ad campaign. We focused our campaign on two weeks and you could really argue that even a two-week ad campaign is not enough to really move the needle on anything. Um, advertising in general needs to be done over and over and over again for a long period of time for people to really get it. But, um, but I think we did enough this year to move the needle at least a little and to raise some awareness. Um, um, I feel lucky that at our library, this per capita grant fund that we get every year, um, I have a lot of access to. I don't know if other states, do other states get, this is federal grant mother money that is distributed through the state library. Mm -hmm. We do do but that here. in jeopardy because it's a federal grant. Right, yeah, we do okay. do some of that similar stuff here. Um, but then we have IMLS fund things, so there's various different things that can be filtered, at least for here in Nebraska, filtered through us as the state library and then out to the libraries. So in our library, we use this. I, I know that different libraries use this in different ways. We really look at this per capita grant as um, fund as the place to put the stuff we would love to do. But if we don't get it, which we always have, but if we didn't, um, it would be okay. We wouldn't have to do it. And for most of the library, they don't really know what to put there. Um, and so a lot of it winds up being my budget and then um, things like digitization projects, or kind of special one-off projects that our librarians are conceived of doing. Um, for me, that means that I actually get way more money in my marketing budget than I would get if it were in our regular budget. Um, because this, this area is kind of, it's kind of a blind eye to our board. They just see it as grant funds and it, it kind of is in a different portion of our budget and it is not as challenged and I have more, I just have more access to it. Um, the other thing that happens a lot of times, and I don't know if this will happen in other libraries, but has been an opportunity for me, is that um, it is September, let's say, and I've spent my money and my per capita, my portion of the per capita budget, but there's three other projects that other departments of our library had intended to do but never got to. And so it really becomes apparent that they're not going to spend it. So our library director is like, hey, I've got an extra 30 grand. Who has an idea of what to use it for? And I, I always do. Um, and so that's how I've been able to kind of appropriate funds over the years. And once I've done it one year, that's how I did this campaign to start with, actually. Um, there was an extra, I think, $11,000 two or three years ago available in September that we weren't going to use and I was like, I'll do some advertising and that's how this started and then kind of built my budget, budget a little bit up a little bit more and more each year um, for this particular ad campaign. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is be opportunistic and, and um, try to keep track of those funds and ask questions and find out if that money is being spent and if it's not, it just goes away. So I'll try to spend it. Um, what I've learned part two, you don't need to be a media buying expert. I had enough exposure to media buying in my past to know that there are people who are professionals that do this and it can be a little intimidating thinking I can't do this myself, but um, again, I just decided that I was going to go to the places where I knew we needed to advertise and there weren't that many of them because we were doing a really localized campaign, really trying to focus as much as possible on our own town. And I just really trusted um, our, our reps there to steer me in the right direction. 
Um, what I learned part three is focus your target and your message. Um, the first time I did the campaign three years ago, it wasn't just about e-resources. It was like e-resources and books and movies and, you know, it was kind of what I think you see a lot of times in the advertising that libraries do is kind of like they try to include everything that the library does in their ads and it's just too much. So um, trying to focus on one kind of product or service, sending one specific message to one specific group of people is is the route to go. When I was developing the campaign this year, um, I had just come back from a two-day conference called Content Jam. Um, I kind of run our library blog and do a lot of our web content stuff. And this two-day conference was really great. It's all about content marketing. Um, but there was a presentation about, about developing your audience and writing to your audience and picking an audience. And it really convinced me overall that, um, that you need to focus. You don't have to do just one campaign for your whole library, but you need to focus on what audience per campaign, which is what we tried to do here to the extent that we could. Um, and they also convinced me that, you know, just because you're targeting it towards one audience doesn't mean that other people who aren't in that audience won't notice it. They will notice it. Um, the thing that stuck with me from that, from that seminar was as long as you are not offensive to other user groups with your ad, other people who it is relevant to will see and get the message as well. Um, what I learned part three, good design matters. Um, really, if you don't have internal resources to, to design kind of a clean campaign, it's really worth it to invest in a freelance design professional to help you execute your campaign. Um, I like the way our campaign looks this year. I really like our concept. If we had a little bit more time and um, a little bit um, more professional focus on, you know, real kind of advertising campaigns, I think it could be even better. But I still think I, I like our campaign a lot. I think it's got a good, strong focus, and our graphic designer is really good and very helpful on that. If you don't have access to that, um, see if you can carve at least like fifteen hundred dollars out of your budget to have somebody design the campaign for you. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Um, yes, Heather. Um, actually, there were um, a couple that came in while you were just talking at the end here um, that I was just holding on to. Um, one first question that came in, and I can't recall if you mentioned this specifically, pulled it out or not. Were you able to measure your response from print media? Like um, yeah. So I'm looking at the print media ad, and from the print one, the, the, the dedicated URL we created for the newspaper ads, we had 34 click-throughs. Mm. Cool. Okay. So that was the lowest by far of the three ways that we advertised. Print media, mm. online digital ads, and then that email direct, direct email. And the email and the online got more response. It got way more. Yeah. I, mean, you were, I mean, granted, you were already online and they had live Mm -hmm. like, you know, they had you, you know, oh, yeah, it's much easier to just go ahead and click on the thing you're looking at. Absolutely, yeah. We had 34 people go and directly type into their browser bar the URL that was printed in the ad campaign. Okay. Um, okay. Which is 34 more, you know, 34 new users. Is, oh, sure. Is, is, you know, it's questionable, again, whether that's a bad or a good number. I don't know, you know. Our, it's better than our, zero. <laughs> media people are delighted to get 34 more new users. You know, when we talk about kind of our on a monthly basis, that's kind of, you know, the scheme. I think mm -hmm. we I think we currently have for um, for Frigo, which is our e music sharing site, which is really, you know, it's good. Um, but I think we only have like we have like two hundred people who've used who use it on a regular basis mm. after two years of using it. Mm. So you know, you're talking about scale. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have someone who has a question from the audience. I'm going to unmute them here. Uh, you're unmuted, Michael, I think. Yep, yep. Krista, can you yes, hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Heather, uh, the two-part question, which may be a one question, depending on how you answer. Had you looked into TV and radio and or are there any platforms that you've been wanting to do, just haven't found the way or the money yet? Um. We thought about TV and radio. 
Um, my challenge with this campaign, and I don't know if this is a big challenge or not, but in general, um, it's important to our librarians and our board that we reach displaying residents with this information. Mm -hmm. And there is varying opinions on sharing our resources with people who are not displaying residents. Some mm -hmm. people, I mean, one of our values at our library is generosity. It's one of the four things that we, we say we value. And um, most of us believe that you know, we're happy to share anything we have, and you don't need to be a displaying resident. However, to use our resources in this campaign, you need to have a displaying public library card. So when you get to like TV and, and radio advertising, it's very difficult to target to that, to that level. Um, we do in our campaign include verbiage about if you're not a displaying public library called holder, your library still probably offers that. Um, but that's just so that people don't get frustrated. Um, so yes, but we need, we need to figure out a way to target it more, I think, and have a bigger budget for sure. Um, as far as the platform that we haven't used yet, um, I have to say that after this campaign and having the analytics that we had for this particular campaign, I still am on the fence about the effectiveness of this campaign to actually convert people to using our products. I do believe, like I said in the beginning, that anecdotally, it has created a lot of awareness. And it's created a lot of awareness amongst people who are not ready to use these products yet, but maybe in the next year. And now they know, or two, and now they know that their library offers these products. So that's a good thing. Um, but personally, I, I'm thinking more about as we have these new products, um, as we're really the two new centers I talked about, the tech, the kind of the, the petting bar that's going to be there all the time in the tech training center, I'm really thinking about how I can use um, additional funds to do promotion in the library, converting existing library users to use these products. Um, to a large extent, I think that's where our biggest area of growth is right now, reaching our existing users who only read books or only check out music or only use our computers, reaching those people in our building with information about these resources and how they can use it. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks. All right. Um, yeah, you're, I think what you're talking about, about the users, the early adopters in general, like in the world, are already using these services in oh, types of things themselves, maybe separate or outside of what the library offers. And they're already on board with the think fact these things exist. And I think what maybe the library is maybe focusing more towards would be your average citizen who doesn't generally go and download something and download music and TV shows and figure out how to torrent something or whatever. And that's what I think maybe what you're looking at is those kind of people that yeah. are just sort of kind of hearing about it, but now the library can get them on board with what you said, the upcoming yeah. training, yeah. We've had a lot of focus within our library on promoting the resources, but not a lot of focus on promoting the, tra the training mm -hmm. that we offer to learn how to use our resources. And we haven't been doing a tremendous amount of training to use our resources. Um, but that's where our opportunity lies, and that's what I'm excited about spending more money on in the future, mm -hmm. I think. Well, we have one more question that came in. If anybody has any other ones, feel free to type them in. We still have plenty of time. Um, but this is a nice kind of end of the show question, too. Um, what will you do next differently next year? Um, I'm going to ask for a little bit more money. <laughs> and I, um, I think the question about um, testing messages is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. I, I really would like to figure out how we can tweak all of the wording in our ads. To get more get more action. Um, I think um, again, what I just said. What I want to do next year is I want to extend the whole campaign into the library as well and wrap it around all of these new training centers mm -hmm. that we're doing. Um, I, I really truly believe that our products that we offer and the ability of our of our audience to use these products at this point is not is not matching up and. Um, and I, I, think our, I think that reaching out to that group of people and training them to use our products is, is where it's at as far as like kind of true meaningful usage of our products in the future. Mm -hmm. That's definitely an obvious um, you know, 
direction to go from what you've been doing is right into with that. And especially since, since you're having all this new, these new areas in the library built, that's great. <laughs> Perfect yeah. timing. Yeah, I mean, it's really fun to do an advertising campaign. I loved it. Mm -hmm. It was great. Um, it's great to see your stuff out there. It's great to see your library in the newspaper. and um, That's great. I think our opportunity lies within our walls mm -hmm. um, as far as growth goes in the future. Cool. All right. Well, while we were chatting just now, no new questions have come in. So I think unless anybody has anything desperately urgent that you want to type in right away, <laughs> um, I think that um, this is a good time to uh, wrap up. Yeah, we've got all the questions answered. Um, any last uh, thoughts, Heather, that you want to get out there? I uh, know. There's my email again, hmoff at dppl.org. So if anybody would like to email me or reach out at any time, please do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, if you do come up with questions, thoughts, you're trying to work on a campaign like this for your own library, um, contact Heather and she can definitely um, give you some tips and tricks for that. All right, so thank you very much, Heather. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I'm going to pull back presenter control to my computer now to wrap up and see what we got coming up next on the show. There we go. Uh, so, yes, the show has been recorded and will be available soon, probably later today, if everything goes well. Um, and, Heather, if you wouldn't mind um, sending me your slides or a link to where the slides are posted, we can include those in the show notes as well. Um, the uh, recording will be put onto our Encompass Live website down here underneath our um, upcoming shows. We have a link to archived Encompass Live sessions, and we've got all of our shows here. So you can see, um, this is what we did last week, we have a link to the recording, which goes up on YouTube, the presentation, and any websites that are related to the session. And I've been collecting here in our delicious account um, for the Library Commission, basically, um, the, that save page that you guys put together, the special splash page for the uh, campaign, and then the actual um, blog post that I first saw where I first discovered uh, this campaign from the Illinois Libraries uh, Association. So if you want to go ahead and read that, what um, had, Heather had written up before will be included afterwards as well. So uh, just trying to get myself situated on my side here. Okay, so that will wrap it up for this week's show. Um, I hope you join us next week when it is our uh, monthly tech talk with um, yeah, with Michael Sowers. Uh, Michael, that was actually him who was asking the question on the microphone there, in case anyone's wondering, <laughs> um, our staff here. Uh, Michael is our technology innovation librarian here at the library, Nebraska Library Commission. And once a month, he comes on and does an Encompass Live session that is definitely more techie related. Um, we sometimes have tech related things throughout the month, but it's always the last Wednesday of the month would be him. And uh, next week, he will be on with um, Juan Denzer, who is from Binghamton University Libraries in Binghamton, New York, which is actually my undergraduate alma mater, um, talking about SMS service, true SMS service um, through the um, integrated library system. So uh, definitely sign up for that next week and any of our other future shows. We have them listed here for the next um, February and March shows, and we have things scheduled out further on we'll, that will be added here as we get our descriptions and uh, schedules together. Also, if you are a Facebook user, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so please do go ahead and like us over there on Facebook, and you'll be notified of when shows are available. Um, I do reminders, like you see, here's the one from this morning. Log in right now for this week's Encompass Live. Um, I let I post when the recording is actually available, so you can find out that from there as well. So if you are big on Facebook, please do go ahead and like like our Facebook page. Um, other than that, that wraps it up for today's show. Thank you very much for attending, and we will see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.